Stephen Sutton. Come on down. that voters look for in a president. And uh, they cumulatively add up to about 84% of the voters. So it's not all of them. But, um, and now that I said all of them, you know I'm from New York. <laughs> Usually it takes me to say Long Island. Oh, yeah. and, and that's one word, Long Island. Um, and those four things are, does the candidate share my vision of America? So there are vision voters. There are also value voters, different. Similar, but different. Does the candidate share my values? The third large category, and they're all about 20%. Some are 20, one's 23, one's 18, but cumulatively it's 84%. A third one was uh, leadership. Does the candidate have the leadership I want in a president? And then there's the fourth category we'll get to in a moment. Vision voters. Romney won vision voters by around eight points. You could argue he should have won more, but he did win them. Value voters, he won them by 12 points. Again, you could argue he should have won them by 20 points, but he won them by 12. He won leadership voters by about 18, 20 points. So why weren't we all dancing at his inaugural ball? Well, because half of us can't dance, but aside from that, <laughs> because of the last and final category, does the candidate care about people like me? Caring. Mitt Romney lost caring voters 81 to 19 by over 60 points, wiping out the other three categories. So there's an old expression, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that single <coughs> mantra should be our guiding principle for the next 50 years. Voters have to be convinced that you care about them. And what undermined Mitt's caring? What single event occurred during the election Right. It was Mitt's 47 percent count, right. and that occurred at a, at a fundraiser, which he thought was off the record. You're never off the record. 
except right now. <laughs> I can say anything, no one's going to know. In, in today's society, when you walk outside your door, and even when you're not, when you're at home, if you're typing something online, it's, it's public. At Leadership Institute, we, we do career counseling, we do uh, 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 private consultations with young people. It's, a, it's appalling the stuff that they put on their Facebook pages. And, and it's just astonishing that people still, to this day, don't understand how public everything is. So, and that stuff will follow you forever. So Mitt was asked the question, 47% of Americans get a government paycheck. How are you going to win the election? How are you going to appeal to those people? That was the question. It's a legitimate question. And by the way, it was being taped by one of the workers at the fundraiser. Not because he was a spy, quite frankly. He just wanted to tape it. He wrestled for weeks whether to turn it over. And finally he did because he thought it was important enough. And turned it over to the last Rolling Stone. And Mitt Romney could have said so many things. And he chose the exact wrong thing to say. And so what he said was, you're absolutely right. And this it wasn't doctored, it wasn't edited, it wasn't taken out of context. This is what he said. He said, well, you're right, 47% of Americans get a government paycheck, and I can't worry about that. Meaning electorally, but nonetheless, that's what he said. I can't worry about that, and I have to focus on the 53%. Quite frankly, what a stupid thing to say. What would Reagan have said? Hmm. Reagan, and I think everyone here, would have said, you know what, you're right, 47% of Americans get a government paycheck. But there are people on food stamps who don't want to be on food stamps, and I will speak to them. There are people getting unemployment who want a job. I will speak to them. And on and on, the litany. How different a message is that? Now you answer the question that way if you care. Right? It's a very uncaring thing to say, 47% of the people get a check and I can't worry about them. I'm not going to worry about those people. The biggest mistake he made was answering the question. The candidates should not... I, when I lecture on Leadership Institute, I try never to say never and always. But here's one of the nevers. <laughs> if you're a candidate, never talk about the mechanics and process of your campaign. And I see them doing it on TV all the time. Never. If it's a process question you want answered, that's a great question. Here's my campaign manager. Because if they say something stupid, you can always fire them. You can't fire the candidate. You can't fire the owner. I used to say that, but then the LA Clipper guy, you know, and he, got, he got fired, so you can fire the owner. And so that, that's just Miss said it. How stupid does who have to be? Two Republicans who cannot understand that you have to message well, correctly. Well, pretty stupid. That's why. I, why we're here tonight, talk about those stupid Republicans. They never learned how to message. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that tonight. Well, sure. But that's, that's a big problem. That's why we need to address it. Um, the left is all about messaging and branding. But it's branding, labeling, branding, and marketing. And what they... Yeah, but they label and brand us. Correct. That's the problem. You know, we, well, we're trying to figure out how to brand ourselves and label ourselves, but we're having to do it on the defensive because they've already labeled and branded us. Right. And the, the, the issue here, you can't expect the left not to do this. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? How do we stop them from lying about us? You know, I used to say, you can't shoot them. But I was lecturing in Oklahoma, <laughs> and they corrected me. Um, <laughs> Tough crowd down there, let me tell you. Yes, sir? Why do our candidates keep labeling and branding each other? Well, that's a mistake. That's a real mistake. It's a real mistake, the violation of the 11th Commandment. And, you know, John Boehner today, talking about Ted Cruz. I mean, you know, it may be true, I don't know. But uh, what are we doing? If you could just rephrase that, 
rephrase the questions as they're asked just for the uh, so everyone can hear them and so that the live streamers can hear them. That'd be okay. great. Thanks. Uh, I was asked to rephrase the question so people could hear. <laughs> for the video. Was that good? Did I rephrase that? <laughs> can I rephrase that? <laughs> Press for you? Perfect. Perfect. Um, uh, okay, there was a question. Why am I so handsome? Is that the... <laughs> okay. Um, one of the nevers also is to never attack your opponents. And I run very aggressive campaigns when I worked in campaigning. I, I, very aggressive. Uh, never attack your opponent. People are shocked. You should never attack your opponent. You should always define your opponent. And that's the difference. Your branding. In the Republican primary of 17 people initially, who was the best marketer? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. The guy is a brand. He, he is a brand. I mean, this is his living, that he's made billions of dollars because he understands it that well. Okay? And so you're up against that. You better learn real quickly. And the way to do it is not to imitate him, as Marco Rubio discovered. And I'm a New York, I grew up in New York City, um, and then we moved to Massachusetts because the Bronx wasn't liberal enough. <laughs> and so, um, I went to high school in Massachusetts. Um, but uh, I got my nomination to the Academy from Ted Kennedy, so uh, the, the joke was on him, I guess. <laughs> But the left understands these things in a way that, that we don't. Um, and so as a New Yorker, um, uh, Donald understands that he grew up in New York City. This is the environment that he's in. And when Marco tried to go to New York on Donald, I, I was personally insulted as a New Yorker. Uh, that Marco would think he could get over, that he would do that. Um, but obviously the error he made was he was not himself. He was trying to be something he is not. Donald is. That way, that's Donald Trump, okay? He's not pretending, he's really like that. So it's sincere, at least. When Marco started doing it, that's when his campaign, I think, ended. It wasn't the debate, Christie, he, he recovered from that. The next debate, he did okay, and that's recoverable. But not being yourself, voters won't forgive that. So don't try and, you know, it's, it was awfully cute that the, the, uh, the Cuban Floridian tried to out New York the New Yorker. It's not going to happen. Uh, I don't care how many New Yorkers move to Miami, you're not going to get the hang of it. And so that was a mistake. But the left is constantly defining conservatives, they're defining you. Because you just understand that's what they're going to do. So you should understand that that's what they're doing, you should understand how to counter it, and then you should do it to them. They're self-defined. It's funny how we win these landslide elections as recently as 2014 and 2010 without doing anything. They just reveal themselves for who they are, and they get crushed. That's what basically happened in 2010, right? After a half a year of Obama, the voters in Massachusetts voted for Scott Brown to take over Ted Kennedy's seat. And the left never thought that would happen. Which is why they dilly-dallied on card check and uh, cap and trade, cap and tax, immigration reform. They could have rammed all that stuff through, but they figured, ah, we got another few months, another year. They had to actually ram through health care when Scott Brown got elected. They said, once he gets sworn in, we're, we can't do it. So they actually ran it through before he got sworn in. And that's why the bill wasn't quite right. <laughs> because they couldn't change it. They couldn't rewrite it. They didn't have time. They had, to, they had to slam it through and just get it done. Which is when Nancy Pelosi, you know, well, we've got to pass it and see what's in it. <laughs> so, so, you know, we like to wring our hands. The world is ending. That's all true. But... Um, 2014 is a pretty big year. I mean, look at the map of the country. If you want some great statistics, go to Americans for Tax Reform's website. And Grover does a great job talking about uh, 
There were 31 Republican governors now. There are 20 uh, states where the legislature, House, Senate, and governor is Republican. I think there's only seven where that's true with Democrats. There's a lot of great stuff happening on the local level. Uh, I mean, we're on the precipice of having a Republican Senate, a Republican House, and a Republican President. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to piss it all away, but <laughs> we're going to screw it up, but you know, <coughs> nah, there's still a chance until it happens. So how do we talk about issues? How do we show people that we care? It's real hard if you're not already involved. Um, at Leadership Institute, when I, um, I, I teach a lot of the different classes in uh, the campaign management school and the candidate school. And uh, it's hard to condense these hour lectures down to two minutes, but I will do it for you. One of the attributes of a successful candidate, there are five, but one of them is a good name in the community. That's important. That's why it's so hard to run for something the first time without a following of some kind. And why it's hard to beat incumbents, because for 18 months out of every two-year cycle, they get to define themselves and build their network at taxpayer expense, legally, that's what they're doing. They're speaking, they're going to forums, they're holding, they're, right? They're, they're building their network. And then you come out of nowhere and say, that guy's a bum. And everyone's like, wait a minute, I, I know that guy. He spoke to the Kiwanis and he spoke at the Raccoon Lodge. <laughs> See, none of the young people know what that means. But believe me, that's funny. <laughs> and uh, so they feel they know the person. And so the negative stuff bounces off. And that's why you cannot approach those people on a strictly issue basis. That kind of describes what's happening at the presidential level. There's a certain number of voters in the Republican Party that are so upset about what's going on, no fact is going to change their mind. And it may drive you crazy, but that's the way people are. On the left, there's a uh, cognitive science uh, professor at Berkeley uh, who began talking about this in uh, coffees in Berkeley, and then he probably went down to Oakland, and then he started traveling around the country. And pretty soon he had a following, and he wrote several books on how people make their decisions how they process information. He's written, I think, six, seven, eight books on this stuff for the left. And he is their messaging guru. His name is George Lakoff. His most recent book is The Little Blue Book. Get it? As opposed to The Little Red Book. It's all in here. He, you know, they think you can't read. But he understood that it's not enough for the leadership to understand this, the grassroots needs to understand it. So that as a movement, because that's what they think of themselves as, as a movement, they'll all be on the same page. And he talks about all that stuff. How do we talk to people? And the point that he makes, he makes many great points. The guy went to MIT, he's brilliant. You'll read through the book, and you'll hear Barack Obama, Elizabeth Warren, who is the best on their side. And if you want to know what they're saying about stuff, go to Elizabeth Warren's website. They, they don't keep it a secret. She, she writes off ads, she puts stuff on her website. You want to know what the language is that they're using, just read it. There's the secret. His first big book was this one, The Political Mind. There's a whole chapter in here, why you should not call it the war on terror. You wonder why the left doesn't say war on terror? You wonder why Barack Obama, it just drives you crazy. Why won't he say war on terror? Chapter 6, or whatever it is. It, it, he says, do not call it the war on terror. And the reason is because, as a cognitive scientist, behavioral scientist, he understands the power of words and frames. And as we grow up, we develop frames, frames of reference things that we filter language through our experience and those of others that we follow. And so when you say war, what's the first thing you think of? 
it conjures up an image, but of a battle and a conflict between the good and the bad, and, and, right? It just does. You don't have to think about it. His very first book was Don't Think of an Elephant. Not because that's what the public are, but he's saying, as soon as I say, don't think of an elephant, what do you think of? An elephant. An elephant. But more than that, it brings an image to mind, right? It could be an African elephant, or it can be an, an elephant from India, big ears, small ears. It could be a white elephant, but an elephant. You can't not think of it, and you can get an image in your head, right? So when we say the word war, it conjures up a certain frame of reference. The older you are, the closer to World War II and World War, uh, Korean War, and even Vietnam, oh, real wars. So my father told me once, he said, uh, World War II, that was a real war. You know there was an 18 month period in World War II, 18 months, when the United States lost 400 dead per day for 18 months. Think about that. In a population of 100 million people, not 300 million. Think about that experience of going through that. Same thing with the word terror. When someone says terror, terrorism, it conjures up a certain image, doesn't it? So when you say war on terror, he's telling liberals and progressives, don't agree to that language. Because as soon as you talk in those terms, you lose. If you accept the premise of a war on terror, you lose the argument. Yes? How come the war on women was so successful? Excellent question. Why is the war on women so successful? The same thing. Because it conjures up a conflict, and they're the good, and people who disagree with them are the bad. The left actually sits down and thinks of these things. They have meetings, Chuck Schumer, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, Elizabeth Warren, I mean, they, they, have, they have meetings that think up all this stuff. We don't do any of that stuff. What's our war? Not the war on terror. What's the other war that we talk about? It's the war on coal. The war on coal, okay? So theirs is a war on women, which is that person, and ours is a war on a piece of rock. Which one is more caring? But at least we're trying. Somebody came up with the war on coal. Yeah, they get a B minus. <laughs> How about a war on miners? And by the way, this is not hard, you know. I'm really not that smart. I just read their stuff and then copy it. I learned at an early age the art of originality is concealing your source. <laughs> so what do we do on our side? Who are our gurus? That's theirs. And you should buy their books. I don't have extra copies. These are my masters, and so I can't throw these at you as much as I would like to. So this is their book. What's our book? Oh. <laughs> this is ours. Now you know why we're losing. This is by David Horowitz. Oh, yeah. right, for those who are not familiar with him, Horowitz was, uh, well, his parents were communists, avowed communists, raised by communists, and he was a, a radical leftist in the 60s. And he started a magazine with Peter Collier <coughs> named Ramparts, as in over the ramparts. You know? and, uh, but he saw the left from the inside, and he became revolted by what he saw saw that they were insincere, and uh, they were just basically a bunch of, uh, in, in the 60s, a bunch of communists that were uh, using uh, people, the useful idiots that I think Lenin or Stalin called uh, people of good heart trying to help people. We can manipulate them, and before they know it, they'll have supported all the garbage that we want to pass. And um, so now he's, uh, he runs the Freedom Center, I think it's called, in California. And go to their website. Anything that David has written is just spot on. And the title of this pamphlet is Go for the Heart. That's what he's talking about. Brian Kilby was interviewing um, Donald Trump right before he was about to go on stage at one of his uh, rallies on 
Long Island. And at the end of the interview, he said, uh, uh, you know, Donald likes to say, I don't use a teleprompter, everything's all the time. Mm -hmm. And so Kilmeade said, so, got any notes? You know, he's about, he's like behind the curtain backstage. He's about to jump up, you know, to, and uh, so you have any notes, any prepared speech? And Donald says, nope. That's a mistake. What should he have done? That's what he should have done. Again, B minus. Now, B minus is enough to win a nomination these days, I suppose. <laughs> but he should have done this. There's no leftist that wouldn't have done this. It's from here. So that's, that's, you know, compassionate conservatism, which I think is redundant. I think I'm a conservative because I really want to help people. And I'm, I'm convinced that the way to do it is through all the conservative things. Okay, liberalism is a disaster on so many levels. And that's the case that we need to be making. So Horowitz recently came out with a book. See, that really is a book. It's a compilation of his essays. The first chapter is Go for the Heart. So it's a little discombobulated, but it's pretty good stuff. Take no prisoners. And the point that he makes is fight fire with fire. That's the mistake we make. We're just so nice, apologetic. Don't want to offend people. Who's the biggest offender out of the 17 running? It's not that people are angry, it's just they want an aggressive, I think, conservative. They want someone who will defend it and attack on it and has the moral high ground. They're tired of, apo tired of apologists. And that's why we end up with Ted Cruz and Donald Trump as the last two standing. That's what I'm tired of. Another person who's really good on this stuff on our side is uh, Newt Gingrich, and he's got a website, newt.org. Check that out, everyone. None of this stuff is a secret. You'll start seeing patterns, you'll start seeing language being important. Uh, Lakoff is also a, a, a language guy, he's a linguist. So language is very important. And he explains language brings up frames of reference. So when you say war on terror, it brings up a frame. George Lakoff, L-A-K-O-F-F. -F. I'm sorry, can you repeat his name again was the question. <laughs> George Lakoff. So just get the stuff and read through it. You'll have to stomach the grotesque mischaracterization of what it is to be a conservative. They really don't like you. Because they think... You know, you know if, if I believed half of what he thinks of conservatives, I'd hate us too. It's astonishing. They really, but this is what they think of us. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, how do you feel about the idea that there are liberals who think that they're not liberals? Well, to, to, to quote a presidential uh, candidate, he knows exactly what he's doing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I need to say it three more times. Um, the question was, how many of how many liberals do I think liberals uh, really believe this? What percent are sincere? I don't know what percentage are, but I divide conservatives and liberals into two halves because I'm a navy guy. I can only think of twos and fours. And, I can't get higher than that. <laughs> to me, there's two types of liberals. There's people who really believe this stuff. They really do. They are sincere. You walk up to someone and say, all you want to do is redistribute income. And they say, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. I think rich people should, yeah. So they're sincere. I've got three wives. I used to have three teenagers, and then my oldest turned 20. And now she's 21, so I Whoa. can't say that anymore. Oh, she gets to vote? My 18-year-old, she yeah. turned 18 yeah. yesterday. Oh, yeah. Yesterday. Oh, okay. And we had that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm prohibited.
anybody come from her until she's 25. <laughs> <laughs> but you've taught her right. Um, Let her uh, yeah. she's, my, she's my condola, okay? And, oh. But she has an open mind, so that's fine. Um, so where was Oh, so to me, there, there are a bunch that really believe this stuff. Now, believe it or not, you can talk to them and work with them because maybe not in a campaign setting, but in a non-campaign setting, you can say, you know, I wish those things helped people, but they don't. Charles Krautheimer has a great answer when asked, why are you a conservative? He says, because I was trained as a doctor, and empirical evidence is important to me. And we've had 50 years of empirical evidence of liberalism. So a, a liberal who really believes that, they're motivated by what? But because they really, they care. They really care about people, so they want to help people. They think that's the way to do it. You can sit down with them and show them it's not really helping. And you can make progress on that. Then there's the people who know it doesn't work. They know it doesn't work, but it works politically. And they are just evil. And you must, des you must destroy them. You must destroy them <laughs> electorally. But there's no reasoning with them. You can say, you know, this stuff doesn't work, and they'll go, yeah, I know it doesn't work, but it helps me get elected. Well, you can't reason with them. And so I leave it to you to figure out which is which. But there are some sincere ones that, that, that really do believe this stuff. I don't think Obama's one of them. That's, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. You don't think you think Obama? What? I think Obama knows it doesn't work. Oh, yeah. It works oh, politically though, and they're after the political power. So it's power. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I would suggest that they don't they don't care about messaging. They don't care about messaging? No, because they want to continue their status quo, which keeps them in power. No, I think the political class, the political class that they are, that they, they want. There's not much difference in a lot of the Republicans that are there today. And well, that's a different discussion, but as far as the, the left and the right, though, and conservatives versus liberals, we can talk about the insincerity of Republicans and being rhinos. That's a separate discussion. But um, they're not in charge. They, Obama has said that he's frustrated as president. He realizes being community organizers where it's at. Um, he hasn't gotten half the stuff done that he's wanted to get done because they haven't had the power. If you think that they just want the status quo of minority in the House, there's so much more that they want to do. They, this is nothing compared to what. If you want to know what they want to do, go to the Progressive Caucus's website. They have the Progressive Caucus. Now, on our side, the Freedom Caucus, I think it's 20 people. The Progressive Caucus, I think, is 75 of, of the Democrats in the House. And read those bills that they've introduced. Oh my gosh! And that's just the beginning. The word no, they, they will never be satisfied. They are always going to come after us. They want more and more, not just power, which leads to control. They want to transform the world. And that's not what we want to do. We should consider what we want to do more of a crusade, but we don't. We just want to manage the problem. That's why we talk about competence a lot. I don't think it's about competence. If only the rollout of healthcare had been better done. If only if they hadn't botched the, the no, the, the whole thing was a mess, you know? If you, if you talk about competence, then you're suggesting that Sibelius was replaced by uh, Warren Buffett, uh, then it'd be okay. Well, no, then the website would have come out on time and, and uh, would have done what it was supposed to do, which was destroy health care for 85% of Americans to help 15%. That does, uh, so Mitt Romney wanted to manage the chaos. Newt talked very well about that. He said, I'm not going to manage the chaos. I want to transform government. And so that should be our quest, if you will, and, our, uh, and how we want to get out of people's lives and move things down. Um, so uh, I, I don't think that they want the status quo. I, I think they want a lot more. I'll go to the back and then I'll come up. Yes, sir. Steve, could you finish that thought? Though you said there's there's two sides of the you know the there's two types of there's two types of conservatives too. You want me to get to them? Also, yeah. yeah. I'm sure. curious about that. Okay. Um, the question was finish the thought. There's two types of liberals: those who believe and those who use it politically. The two types of conservatives. Um, There are conservatives who really believe that people should pick themselves up by their bootstraps. I did it. If you can't, then there should be very little government. 
And I don't think you win many elections with that. Uh, we should move in that direction, perhaps, but I, I think some of us sometimes are a little too extreme. And then there's the compassionate conservatives who understand that, when well, I understand, they believe government should at least steer the boat and help out. And I think most of us would fall in that category. Uh, I'm all for getting rid of certain departments. Um, and if I ever said I wanted to get rid of three, you could be sure I'd remember which one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there does get to come a point where Americans have spoken, and they want a safety net. And um, now, it should be a better managed one. It should empower people and not tear families apart like welfare. Um, we won the welfare argument. Now they're eating away at the law and they're shifting it back to the way it was, and we need to be more vigilant about this stuff. But I think we need more aggressive spokespersons for individual responsibility and all the things that we believe in. Um, but in a government that will help to do those things. Quick example um, in Arizona, they just passed, I think the governor signed it into legislation. There's now a law that every child must pass a civics exam to graduate from high school. That's pretty clever when you think about it. Let the left oppose that. <laughs> and now they have to study civics to pass the test. So that's something that we should be doing. Um, uh, Constitution Day. Um, it's a federal law that you have, to, you have to teach something about the Constitution in public schools on Constitution Day. But something. But how many schools don't know that? How many schools aren't held to account? Okay, but I bet if you were to go around, figure out what the law group says, and then survey all the schools in Loudoun County, and find out which ones aren't doing it, and point it out, and then they're going to do it. So, that, I mean, I, I could come up with a hundred ideas for projects for you to do, but there's plenty of stuff to do within the context of the government. You know, I'm not for doing away with, I'm doing away with the Department of Education, but I'm not for doing away with government education, everyone should be homeschooled. Fire every teacher. Government shouldn't be doing that. I don't, you know, I don't think that's what we should be doing. So I think we have uh, um, some purist conservatives that want to go a little too far. You can argue where to draw the line, but, um, but then I think you have compassionate conservatives. I'm a conservative because I care about people and I want to help them. And, and, and if, you, if, if you don't take that approach, I'm not sure you should run for office, quite frankly. Because you're not going to get elected. And you certainly, certainly aren't going to be in a majority to do anything anyway. So, but we can, we can argue about where to draw that line. Um, but it's not where the left's drawn it. Because I don't think they really want to care about helping people. I think it is about the power. They know better than you. They actually don't believe in vouchers, for example, school vouchers, because they don't believe that parents will make the right decision on which school to send their kids in. They really don't believe that they will. We can't let people have vouchers. And what if they screw it up? They can't have personal accounts for their social security. What if they screw that up? They really believe they are smarter. People are stupid. They're smart. They're the elitist. They should be in control of these decisions. They actually believe that. And I don't think that we do on our side. Finally. Thank you. Um, his was my question, but I'm going to ask you to do something you've been dancing around for the last few minutes, and that is to draw the line. Names? Yeah, <laughs> to draw the line for our current two uh, leading candidates. Right. Regarding this question of uh, care and, and where they fall in the category. Okay, for the time. Uh, do they care? Um, they're going to lose that argument against Hillary, I'll tell you that. What do you mean? Everyone is going to be sent a wallet-sized picture of Hillary's grandchild before this election is over. If we're not talking about her, she's, I'm surprised it's taken her so long. You know, and uh, she's going to be the most caring, compassionate person on the face of the earth. And by comparison, uh, I don't think uh, Ted or Donald understand how to talk in those terms as well as they should. But Donald does it the most, by the way. I mean, he... He makes a good point. He goes, I'm running for office. He goes, this is a pain in the ass. I don't need to be doing this. You know? You know? And so, yeah, he's arrogant. He's got an ego. But he can make the argument, I'm doing this a personal sacrifice. Because I believe in the country. I wish he said more, I believe in you, rather than I believe in the country. 
but that's against his nature. So, so he's not as good as he could be, or he thinks he is. Well, no, I think, I think yeah. he's getting a lot of messaging against her calling her the crow. Right. Which she is, okay? Yeah, but I think I like what Jeb Bush said. I, I, You're not going to win the presidency insulting people. I think he does, though, because he said, this is all about you. Imagine right. Well, he, well, he's getting better. He's getting better. You know, when he first started, there was none of that. Now he's getting better at it. But he's going to get a lot better, a lot better. Are yeah. you in the role so, in <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't expect that. I know Corey. Corey, his manager, was. Corey was a, was a chief of staff on the Hill when I was the chief of staff, so I, I know Corey fairly well. And uh, um, but Corey's not running the race. Donald's running the race. You know. Corey's running Donald as best he can. You know. But by the way, it's always the candidate's fault if their mistakes are made. You know, if they don't have the right people, it's their fault for not hiring the right people. Nobody else, There's, their name's on the stationery. Hmm. It's always the candidate's fault. Always. Well, their staff didn't tell them to do this. Well, chances are the staff did tell them, but they just didn't do it. Or they picked a staff that didn't tell them. That's the staff they picked. They picked yes men or, or whatever. It's, it's always the candidate's fault. So. You've used the term conservative. Passionate conservative a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I first heard it from W. I don't know if that's true. But I, I, think, I, think, I, I think that's fair. That's okay, well, I, then I equated W with a caring conservative, caring to the point that he would raise taxes a lot, increase the debt a lot. So when I hear the term con compassionate conservative today, I think, oh, that is a conservative who doesn't mind raising taxes. Is I that think that's fair. I think that's fair. The, the, the comment was when you hear compassionate conservative because it kind of started with W. Bush and Bush then raised taxes and was kind of a, a squish on some things or a rhino, that, that it, 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 well, that tarnished the word and the brand of being a compassionate conservative. But I still think that we should take that back. And uh, by the way, Mitt, really, Mitt Romney is a compassionate guy. But at the convention, is. They brought all the people in front and said, we all these great things. And we think we say things once and everyone's heard it. And then we talk about what we want to talk about. And, and, and campaigns aren't like that. You've got to hammer it over and over again. How can you not know you're losing Karen voters by 60 points? I guarantee the polling showed it. And I guarantee he was told you need to show that side of you more. And for whatever reason, they, I believe they thought they were six, seven, eight points ahead, which I think they were at the end. They just decided that. It's like a sporting event, though. You know, the team that gets up 20 points and they stop doing what got them there, right? And then they they lose their momentum and the other team catches up. It's it's, just, it's classic stuff. You know, you've got to, if, if if you're defeating the other team, you keep doing what defeats defeats them, and you make them force you to change. If they never do, then you win. If they do, then you change and adapt, and you can still win. So two out of three times, you're going to win. But if you just sit on your lead, and they do something to address your victory or your winning, and you don't change, how many football games have we watched where that's happened? Basketball games, hockey games. The, the hardest lead to keep in hockey is a two-goal lead, right? Because you're sitting on it, you think, you know, and then suddenly they score once, and uh, and then you freeze up, and then they score again, and, and we just see that happen all the time. So um, I still think we should be caring. You've got to. People have to know that you care, or you will not win. And I'm not sure you should. And you can say I care so much, we need to cut these programs because they're making you uh, permanent. Uh, permanently addicted to government programs. That's legitimate. I'll get to you in a second, but she's got the mic. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so Stephen, um, you're talking a lot about the the national, you know, political scene and, and the season and how it's happening and how it has happened in the past. But can we turn towards how to apply this in our one-on-one -on -one 
situations in our lives, how do we win with our friends? Okay. How do we talk to them heart to heart, you know, and, and help them to see that against, you know, to see the fallacy of that conservatives don't care. The truth is that conservatives care so much that we're willing to actually help people get on their own and we think that it's a better gift to mm -hmm. help people get off of uh, welfare instead of a nice gift to help them stay on welfare or whatever, you know. Um, so how does it apply to us individually? The principles apply in, as we what we've talked about. So how do we get that on the local level? Well, first of all, when it comes to hardcore leftists, just forget it. I mean, you know, we talk to young people. At the Leadership Institute, our largest programs are what we do on college campuses. And so the question often comes up with the students on campus, you know, uh, how do we convince the, the leftists on campus, you know, that they're wrong? And the, 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 the short and long answer is, you can't. But there's not enough of them to win. There's not. So for the moment, leave them alone. And that's not 47%. <laughs> but the point that Lakoff makes is that everyone is liberal and conservative. They're liberal on some things and conservative on other things. I'm willing to bet that everyone in here has a liberal bone in their body somewhere. Even you. <laughs> and so the point is, and, and this suggests, for example, how to build your club. Um, say you're having a meeting and somebody walks through the door, okay, and the first person that greets them rips open his shirt to reveal his end the fed t-shirt. Or tattoo, even worse. Yeah, everyone laughing's got one, I know. Well, that person might be less likely to show up for the second meeting, if they even stay for the first one. If they walk through, and your first re your reaction to anyone who walks in who's new is, who's that? What do they want? Maybe they're lost. And you're suspicious of new people. That's a tough way to approach things, isn't it? And that comes from the mindset that here are the 10 things we believe, and you need to be all 10 to join our club. So let's flip that a little. A person walks through the front door, and the first thing you do is you say, welcome, what brought you here tonight? Are you here for our meeting? Yes. What brought you out? Oh, I believe that we should uh, uh, name an issue. It doesn't even matter. And they're greeted. Wonderful, you know, we have a committee on that, and the chairwoman is right here. Let me introduce you to her. Or, hmm, we don't have a committee on that. Would you like to chair that committee? <laughs> They're not even sat down yet. Are they likely to come back? Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> You've given them something to do. Maybe we'll... But it's a difference in attitude. The point is, if they are one of the ten things, if that's the one that agrees with you, that's how you build a, a, a larger team and a coalition. I think we need to be more tolerant. It's one of the chapters in Horowitz's book. It's a little snip up. It's cut your candidates a break. <laughs> That's what he writes in the thing. Um, not everyone's going to be 100%. Now, I know we've been burned by rhinos. We can get into that also, but that's not what we're talking about. The way, it's the Reagan lecture series. Let's tell the Reagan uh, understanding of how you build a winning coalition and how you do this on the local level as well. Reagan learned his politics under FDR. And FDR formed this massive coalition saying, if you're rich, don't care about people, belong to a country club, great, you're a Republican. Right? That's what he said. He didn't then say, and then, but if you're these six things, you're us. He said, if you're not them, you're one of us. And he formed this massive coalition of people who, if they were in the same room, they'd kill each other. Which, by the way, is the problem with conventions every four years, because you get everyone in the room, and they say, he's in the coalition? I hate him. If he's in the coalition, I'm out of here. So that's the problem. Do you know how you solve that problem at conventions? Liquor them up and get out of there quick. <laughs> that's the way, you, that's what you do. You, that's why, it's, Conventions are shorter now than they used to be, not because of, of the TV networks, it's because people want to kill each other. Let's get out of here. 
The point is you focus on the other side. You define the other side. You don't vein, define yourselves. In that vein, I mean, the best thing for the lie is the truth. Okay? They have been promoting the lie that the Republicans are the racists. But the Republicans do not fight back with the truth. We're the ones who sponsored them. They are the ones that ended you know, slavery, the party of Lincoln, all of that stuff. And the, the Democrats have so promoted the lie, and the Republicans have refused to battle it with the truth. Truth is an excellent light on the lie. There's even, but there's even more truth than going back 150 years ago. Let's, even go, let's go back 15 days ago. Okay, it is the left whose policies are racist. Personal accounts for Social Security, for example. Under the current system, minorities who die younger don't get the money out of Social Security that they put into it. Personal accounts would give them that money, and if they died early, they could will that to their child. You can bet if the roles were reversed, they would be saying that our position was racist. Have you ever heard personal accounts not privatized, not private accounts, personal accounts, language matters, personal accounts being described that way by us, where if you oppose it, you're a racist? Not even Bush went there. Should have. We need to be much more aggressive. It is their policies that are racist. Remember bilingual education? They had a ballot initiative in California to end bilingual education. It passed with 61%. Because the Hispanic families want their kids to learn English. If you want bilingual education, remember Ebonics, remember that nonsense? Let's bring that back and vote on it. To force them to expose themselves for the idiots that they are. That actually went to trial, I believe, in Oakland. And they had a child, the, the, the Ebonics people brought a child in to speak Ebonics on the stand. And uh, uh, when the child was done, the judge said, all I heard was bad English. And he dismissed the case. I didn't heard it from about that. Okay? But the point is, if you cannot speak English in America, you're going to condemn a generation of young minority uh, immigrant families and children to lives as uh, chambermaids and dishwashers. You cannot be a doctor, you cannot be a lawyer unless you can speak English. Who's the racist? That's how aggressive we should be. The left's bumper sticker should be every city like Detroit. <laughs> That's what it should be. And we should carry that message. Schools, we should own education as an issue. Do you know that in Washington, D.C., we had the um, scholarships for private schools? Vouchers. The vouchers. Very clever. Government wouldn't do it, so a private group of rich guys got together and offered a thousand scholarships on lottery. 10,000 families applied, 1,000 got it, and 9,000 became victims. And they're all screaming, where's mine? You know the Washington Post supports vouchers? They do. It's not fair not to give it to everybody. You know Marion Barry, who was a councilman, supported vouchers? You know why? Because in his ward, they're screaming for it. So that's how aggressive we should be. We should go right after them all. And that's the point that Horowitz makes. Takes no prisoners. He said, you got to fight fire with fire. you got to make them the racists. So it's not even defending and, and explaining the history of 150 years ago. I can't wait till uh, who's going to be on the... Uh, Harriet Tubman? Who's going to be on the, on the 20? Okay? Because there is a, a, a Christian, gun-toting Republican. Okay? You know, that the left has a whole program of activism. They, they have uh, stamps where they stamp money with uh, different sayings. Uh, you know, Obama, you know, he's giving you more of these dollars. He's reduced the debt. You know, they do that. Well, why are we doing that? You get a sticker and say, great, a Republican woman. A Christian Republican woman who liked guns. Then we should stamp that on every bill. Now, by the way, there are machines that kick them out if they're stamped in the wrong place. You have to know where to stamp them. But there's a project for you. Well, it makes a difference to them. But, you know. Yeah. 
So, but the point is, we, I, I, I completely agree with you, but we need to be more aggressive, even more aggressive. They are the racist policy, a, a party. And by the way, not willingly, you know, I'm willing to concede your heart to the right place, okay? What percent are sincere? I don't know. You know what? I'm not going to go there and say, oh, this is just a, a plot uh, to destroy America because you're a commie pinko spy. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm not going to go there. I said, you know what? I think your heart's in the right place. I think you want to help people. But sadly, your policies don't help. In fact, they hurt. Not only do your policies fail, they make the problem worse for the very people that you're trying to help. So if you really want to help people, you'll look at this issue and you'll understand that giving people loans to buy houses they can't afford wiped out 50% of the wealth in the minority communities of this country. 50%. And it wasn't businesses forcing this on people. It was groups like ACORN forcing banks to make loans in minority communities that people couldn't afford. Well, they can't afford it. If you don't give them a loan, it's racist. So it's going to be a 0% loan. And I, I, I apply to refinance during all this. And I'm used to confirmation of employment, what's the likelihood of employment, what, you know, three months' worth of, worth of, of, of uh, of, of your, of your, your, your life package, your, your, your payments, your pay stubs, and all that stuff. I applied. And uh, the next day they call up, you're approved. I said, well, don't you need all this, this, this stuff? Oh, we don't do that anymore. I just turned to my wife, who has an accounting background, and I said, that's crazy. We're not going to default, but I said, can you imagine? And that was two years before it all crashed. I didn't understand, I didn't predict the crash or anything, but it's like, you know, economics knows no, is not partisan. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's gonna blow up and it's gonna blow up. Two weeks ago, I was in Greece on a vacation with my wife. Oh, what a basket case. <laughs> as bad as you think it is, it's so much worse. And the, the cradle of Western civilization is so sad. There's only 11 million people in Greece. I thought it was larger, it's 11 million people. And they can't even collect the garbage. There's huge piles. It looks like New York on, on the garbage strike. They actually bring in the, uh, the military comes in every three months to clean it up. This is the magnitude of, of the problem. They had to change the laws, and they had to, because the IMF said, we'll give you the loan, or the EU will give you this loan, but you have to do, you have to do stuff. One of the things they made them do, as our cab driver explained to me, under previous law, you could retire at the age of 60 on a full pension. 60 years old, full pension in Greece. And that doesn't mean full salary, but a pension, but not so little. So they passed a law, and they didn't grandfather it, and they didn't roll it in. They had to pass it on this day. We're changing the law, and then you have to be 67. Well, if you were, if your birthday is two days after that day, You'd be upset. You'll be burning stuff in the street. I think everyone would. So by two days, I have to work seven more years. I'd be upset. But that's what's going on there. And that's just one of the things they had to do. It's just such a mess. There's not a place we went. In every port, it was a cruise, so it was, you know, every day a different port. And so everywhere we went, when they presented the check, every time, discount for cash. I said, I'll bet discount for cash. So there's a huge underground economy now. That's the Laffer curve. You raise taxes high enough, you get zero revenue because no one's paying anything. So the, 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 the barter market must be going crazy over there. And it, it's just a downward spiral. You know, see Detroit. The left solution, by the way, were people moving out of Detroit because taxes are too high is pass high taxes statewide. So they can't leave, you know, they can't. And then if, if Michigan's taxes are too high, pass them nationally. And then you can't go anywhere. And then if you want to escape to another country, you're not allowed to do that. And that's where, this, that's where it goes. But that's how you can expose the left for what they really are. Look at the progressive caucus and stuff. You know they want to change January 1st? It's no longer going to be New Year's Day, it's going to be Peace Day. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making this stuff up. It's crazy. They want a peace academy. They want a peace department and a police and a, and a peace academy, just like West Point and, and uh, a peace academy. I, I go, that's every other college. What do we? 
<laughs> we had constituents come in and they said, we'd like a peace department. I go, we already have one. Like, we do? I go, yeah. It's got five sides and it's across the river. <laughs> it's called the Pentagon. They were appalled. So I was working with John Klein from Minnesota, so we had a lot of, you know, in Minnesota, we had a lot of liberal people. It was so much fun. I usually didn't take meetings as a chief of staff. I wanted that meeting. So I want to meet with them. We have a peace department. They brought their children in, and it was really funny as I was insulting their parents. <laughs> I didn't insult them, but not, not agreeing with them. Back to my original premise, why, why stupidity? Why, why don't the Republicans there's learn a saying, the stupid stuff that they're doing? Why don't Republicans why learn the stupid stuff? Right. Well, there's a saying that I learned in the military. Um, an army of lions under command of a sheep is to be less feared than an army of sheep under command of a lion. And we don't have any lions. Uh, the left has lions. And we need more lions. When Newt and Tom DeLay and Dick Army were the leadership, you notice the left went after them. They went after Newt with complaints all the time. They tried to indict Tom DeLay, finally found the prosecutor to do so. They went after him. Is anyone going after Paul Ryan? No. They're happy to leave him there because he's not doing anything. Now, it would be worse if Nancy Pelosi were speaker. No question. You look but, but it wasn't them that went after Well, it, it'd be worse. You know it would be. But, my, but I agree with you. I believe with your premise, and I just wish that the leadership would be more aggressive um, and lead. I'll tell you a quick example. When Newt was speaker, when I was up there, the Democrats started their Medicare campaign. They were going to scare everybody on Medicare. If Republicans get reelected, you're going to lose your Medicare. You know, the exaggerated nonsense. But Newt knew that it was. Uh, Dynamite. I mean, we have to deal with it, address it. So he held a meeting, mandatory meeting of all Republican members. They held it in the Ways and Means Committee room uh, because it was, that's the, one of the larger rooms where they've got a lot of uh, famous hearings. I think the Watergate hearings were there. It's a big, big room. Every member had to retire. He said, this is what we're going to do. That's leadership. He said, you're going to meet with three editorial boards in your district and tell them what we're doing. You're going to write an op-ed that's going to be placed in at least six newspapers. You're going to do three mailings to your seniors in your district. And seniors are anyone 50 and above, because the people getting it, they know you're not going to take it away. It's the 50 to 64 year olds who think you might take it out, like Greece. This was 20 years ago, but they, they're the ones who are the most against any changes. And we're going to give you templates on what to mail. We're going to do the whole thing. But if you want the NRCC to help you getting reelected, don't come to me and say, I'm in trouble if you haven't done everything on this list. Then there was about 10 items on the list. That's leadership. And then after that meeting, what happens? The members go back to their offices. Do they tell their staff what happened at the meeting? So Newt had a meeting of all the chiefs. And he went through the same thing. And then because they heard, you know, the chiefs go back. Did they tell the press uh, communications guys what happened? No. He had a third meeting with all the press people. He spent all day doing that. That's leadership. Now, not every office did it, but you know what? Enough of them did. And then he had staff members keeping track of which offices were doing what. And if an office hadn't done something, someone in leadership would call the guy and say, why are you doing your editorial boards? Why aren't you doing mailings? What, what, what are you doing? With half... The Congress, you can do a mailer that goes to half of America and make a difference. And we turn the issue, and it was not an issue in the next election. Are we doing that stuff now? Paul Ryan had a meeting with the freshman members a few weeks ago. Maybe it's a few months by now. And to his credit, he said, oh, you guys should all read Rules for Radicals, because that's what they're doing to you. I'm like, really? Is our, our fund is that tight you can't buy them all a copy and give it to them? But he recommended that they read it. At least that's something. That's a, that's a, that's a C plus. But okay, at least he mentioned it, encouraged them to read it. He should have gave it to them and said, next week we're going to meet, we're going to talk about the first four chapters. We now have a book club. I, I think they should have handed this out. And give it, this is what they're doing to you. 
You will read this and you will hear Elizabeth Warren. You will hear Senator Schumer. They sit down and come up with the war on women and income inequality. Now in 2014, we had issues that benefited us. You want to talk about the failures of this presidency? It's failed. It's corrupt. You can use issues. Issues are what you use to support your frame. So in 2014, there's the IRS scandal, you've got Benghazi, you have uh, uh, the VA scandal, you've got Fast and Furious, the Mission Act, IRS, you've got uh, ISIS, you've got the 50,000 kids coming across the border. But the point is, did we come up with any of those? So we were fortunate that the current events cycle stuck it to them, but we didn't sit down and say, Lack of leadership. Because when, well, we're not sitting down doing this. So on their side, they sit down. Okay, we want to make you racists and uh, intolerant. And a few other things, homophobic and other things. You're intolerant racists so, and uncaring. So that's the generic frame that they're defining you. So they said, what issues should we use? So they came up with income inequality. And then the subset, there were issues within income inequality. What are some of the issues? that are a subset of income inequality. There's, there's uh, the disparity in pay for women. What else? There's minimum, minimum wage. wage. There's living wage. There's working wage. There's a few of those. Right? And then they introduce those as legislation and force votes on it so they have people, oh, you voted against that. You're against people. You don't care about people. But the point is, they sit down and actually come up with the issues, and come up with the frame, and come up with the strategies, and the messaging, and the themes. War on women, income inequality. We don't do that on our side. Well, the whole thing is, too, then, we have a world that's been led by the bad actors. And they and what, are the, what, is, what is the message now? We need to have women be inundated with men going to women's restaurants, okay? The transsexual thing. And that's just... That's their, it's an observation of, of where the real problems are. Right, well, that's what well, that does. fight back on that, and that just, and I think that's all the, the, the acts of anger in the country that's made. Is, but there are some who are. So you have to just find them. I mean, they're out there. There are people fighting back on it. So, yes, sir. I think what you're saying is true, but it doesn't quite go far enough, because we, we don't have control of, uh, of the uh, media, the language, the way, the way the mess we don't we can't get a message out. That's fair up to a point. And I say up to a point, I know the country's different, but Ronald Reagan won 49 states. 49 states with a much more hostile press than we have today. That's just a fact. We have a lot of alternative press and media now that never had back then. But he understood how to talk to people. Now the country's different, I'll, I'll grant that, but um, that's the bigger problem. And uh, the press responds to pressure. When someone in the press says illegal immigrant, I guarantee they get a hundred phone calls from people who have read this book where it tells them you call the press and make them use the language you want them to use. Do we do that? When they say we're going to talk about the, uh, the estate tax today, do you call them up and say it's not the estate tax, it's the death tax? I mean, so if you understand language, that's what we should be doing. I swear to God, they have a conference call every morning. This is the word they're going to use because they do. Then, then they go out and every, every you think no, they do. You're absolutely right. Rush right. does a good example of it. He, he will he will do the the, the, the snippets from news agency across the country, and they are repeating the same word. I, word, I, word, I, word, word, word. You're absolutely right. And uh, Chuck Schumer once he had a live mic on a conference call, and, and he thought he was just talking to his people, but the press were on the other end. And he said, okay, today's message is so-and-so, and the word we're using is such-and-such, and, such, and make sure you stay on message. And they picked it up and reported it. So, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. They have daily meetings on this stuff. Um, is Rosa DeLauro still in Congress, Congresswoman from Connecticut? She's still there? I can't remember. You know, they do the one-minute speeches every morning in Congress. You should pay attention to Rosa DeLauro's one minute, because she's married to Stan Greenberg, the pollster. And so whatever she's saying in that one minute in the morning is what they had focus groups on the night before. There's no secret. Whenever she came on, I used to tell the staff, turn that up, I want to hear it. You want to listen to Rosa DeLauro? I said, yeah, I want to listen to Rosa DeLauro. I want to know what she's saying. 
the language she's using. This is what happens on the Sunday talk shows. They send out their messengers on the Sunday talk shows. And the editorial boards around the country, they might play bridge, okay? But you can't really cheat. You can't use foot signals. But there's a, there's a bidding process where you're telling your, your partner what you've got in your hand by the way you bid. And if you, if you learn that, if you learn that, you know how to bid. But that's what they're doing on the Sunday talk show. So the editorial directors are all watching this, and then Sunday, on Monday morning, either they're reprinting it, which is a signal back to the White House, we agree, you can run with this, war on women, or we thought what Susan Rice said yesterday was interesting, but we're not quite sure that this was because of the tape in Benghazi. Signal back to the White House, no, 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 no we're not buying this. And that's all it is. And Susan Rice went on five different shows and talked about it being a tape. She is signaling to their base, this is the message. This is what we're going to say it is. And then she sees if the newspapers repeat it or not. So that's, that is exactly what's going on. It's much more uh, developed on their side. We don't do that. By the way, they think we do that. We don't. We should, but we don't. But they think we do. They think we're geniuses. You know? The war on terror, they think we came up with this. Maybe Carl Rove did, because he is, you know. But on our side, you know, we fall into this. But the point is, we fall into it on current events. I mentioned 2014. These things happened, it benefited us, it showed the failures of the presidency, why you need to check in the balance of the guy. But the current event cycle then shifts. And our guys get elected. They think they're geniuses because they got elected, and you can't tell them anything. And, but what the tide washes in, the tide washes out. And in 2016, there'll be a lot of one-term wonders. You'll wonder, oh, what happened? Well, you, you believed your own press releases. That's what happened. We're, I haven't given away a book yet, so i got to get to the book to give away. We're going to take two more questions. No, we're not. I'm going to give away books. <laughs> okay. No, no. All right. Now, you know, if you want one of these, a better book might be coming up. Hand of Providence. It's about Reagan's... Um, being a, Reagan being a religious guy. Anyone interested? Oh. Do you have a question? On that next. In another vein, another book that, that you should add to the list is the book, uh, I forget the exact name of it, Nancy Pelosi's daughter wrote it. And it's on, on campaigns, boot camp, something or another. Excellent, excellent book. Run how to campaign. Lovely coffee book. It's a love story. Ooh. You already got one. What's your, uh, All right, just keep passing it back until someone takes it. What's your reception? Oh, hang on. I got thrown in the book. What's your reception at colleges with the little snowflakes? They love me. All right. The new revolution. The Reagan Revolution, written by Michael Reagan. This answers all a lot of the questions. What should we do on a local level? So, obviously, she gets one. Boy, this side of the room is going crazy. They free and they over there. Thanks. Here, take, I have one. Give one more away. Okay, um, I guess we'll take one more question. Yeah, that's the end of the book. Okay, so we will not do the drawing, the, the door prize, since people people are getting lots of door prizes. <laughs> and then I'll give us time for one more question. Yes, in the back, please. Good. Um, how do we uh, take away the moral high ground that the liberals... You claim it. Well, when they, when they say things like, if you challenge... How many Syrian refugees would be a good number that we should be taking? If you ask things like that, if your government, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, mm -hmm. and it's all leftist all the time. Of course, yeah. But uh, they take the moral high ground and say, that's not who we are. And it's tough to challenge that. Well, come to our TV training and we'll teach you how to do it. I mean, we, I, I can't, you know, we have community, 15 of our 47 programs are communications programs. And we, we, we talk about how to do that, how to, how to, there's different things that you can do. You have to change the subject, you need to address that issue as well, and then you need to pivot. Uh, and there's ways to do it. Um, 
But the bottom line is to be as aggressively morally uh, superior as they are, because we have the high ground. Their programs have bankrupted the country at the cost of destroying a generation of poor people, of people that are trying to. So to get back to that point, it's not just that the programs fail, they make the problems worse. Okay? And so um, you can just say, you know, that sounds good. Okay? But I hope your child's not in the classroom when one of those people decides to blow themselves up. Oh, how could you say such a thing? Well, that's what happened in San Bernardino, and there are 14 people dead right now because of it. Okay? So I wish it weren't so, but that is the world we live in. Okay? And the crazies on their side, you're not going to convince. But you're looking for those people in the middle who share that. They're, they're, they share that, that same concern. Okay, I guess I'm getting yanked, but uh, <laughs> if you want to know a lot more, I mean, I do a strategy and messaging lecture that Andrew's been through, which is six hours, and we go into how to do a lot of this stuff in a much more detailed, thoughtful uh, way, so you can really come away with some good ways. So come to the Leadership Institute, get young people involved, put them on scholarship. There are, there are people, there are young people, anyone who's majoring in poli-sci in college will be home this summer, okay? They, they'll tell, they say, I, I learned more in four hours at LI than I did in four years in, at, at, the, at college, uh, which is good because they're just training lefties, so I don't want them teaching them. <laughs> and that's what we exist for, so get them trained and, and you'll learn how to do it. And what is then your, it's fun. What is your website? Um, Leadershipinstitute.something. Dot org. Yeah, yeah. yeah. leadershipinstitute.org, look it up, they are so worthwhile, and their, their classes, some of their classes are like two evenings, some of them are one day or three or four days, you know, they're, they're short term things, you don't have to sign up for like a semester of something, and, and so, yeah, I highly recommend the Leadership Institute. Wow, let's give a huge round of applause to Stephen Sutton.